This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 140th edition of the program. Today is Thursday, April 26th, and before we get into the program, I want to take a moment to thank all of our newest Patreon and PayPal contributors. And this week, we had a lot of people sign up, including Adam Belanger, Alexander Smith, Anton, ALMAO, Brett Badolato, Brian Thompson, Daniel Rodriguez, Deborah Thomas, Eric Farragut, Jack Morris, Jacqueline Pago, Jan Masli, Jansen Roberts, JC Nova, Jennifer Mackey, John Bruchley, Cameron Golbabai, Linda J. Dussault, Merrick Ludek, Michael Brandon Stevens, Mike Bones, Randall Semigan, Redemptive Dialectic, Thwan Manga and Tossin Ogic 2, who sent a message along with a donation to us saying, Screw CNN. And you'll find out why he sent that message as we get further into the episode. So I apologize to anyone if I butchered your name, but thank you so much. Um, I get it all the time. My name is Mike Figueredo. Um, nobody can pronounce my last name. So, <laughs> but anyways, thank you for signing up to support us. If you'd also like to support the show, you could visit humanistreport.com slash support or check out patreon.com forward slash humanist report. So on today's episode, first, the DNC is suing Russia, WikiLeaks, and the Donald Trump campaign. We'll talk about their ironic and hypocritical lawsuit and why it's nothing more than political grandstanding. We'll also discuss the Democratic Party's new midterm messaging strategy. And on the topic of the 2018 midterms, a Democratic Party gubernatorial candidate doesn't know what Medicare for All is. We'll talk about that. Also, CNN tries to catalyze another YouTube adpocalypse, and they also smeared Jimmy Dore in the process as a conspiracy theorist. I'll tell you what's motivating them here, and also we'll talk about how an Atlanta journalist used McCarthyism to smear a progressive activist we all know and love, Anoa Changa, and in a surprising turn of events, another 2020 presidential hopeful has decided to reject corporate PAC money after drawing criticism for saying that she would not reject corporate PAC money just a few weeks ago. Now, additionally on the show, Bernie Sanders plans to announce a federal jobs program that sounds just utterly amazing. So I'll break it down for you and tell you the criticism it's already receiving, and we'll talk about the historic levels of hypocrisy from Fox News' Sean Hannity and how, after railing against America's social safety net for decades, he's one of the biggest welfare queens in the country. And getting to more mainstream media news, MSNBC's Joanne Reed did an 11 minute segment profiling 2020 presidential contenders, but she left out Bernie Sanders. And cable news networks are going after Donald Trump for making spelling mistakes because, you know, this is definitely more important than the bevy of other issues they could potentially be discussing. And also on the topic of MSNBC, they aired a seven minute long propaganda puff piece in order to praise Comcast. So we've got a lot to talk about. Let's waste uh, no time because <laughs> I've been itching to get to these topics. So um, I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Just when it seemed like the Democratic Party establishment couldn't get any more desperate in their attempts to distract us from the fact that they're still not really offering anything to voters, we get this. Democrats file suit alleging Russia Trump campaign WikiLeaks conspired to interfere in 2016 campaign. And no, this isn't an article from The Onion, even though I will say that The Onion's satirical take on this is pretty spot on. To the Democratic Party staying focused on the 2016 election and rehashing it again and again and again and again, it's one way for them to not talk about the one thing that we want them to talk about. Policy. So it feels like we're living the same day over and over again <laughs> where we have to relitigate 
the 2016 election, but not the parts that they don't want to look at, where they rigged the primary. They only want to look at the parts where they claim that they were victimized. So according to CNN, the Democratic National Committee is suing the Trump campaign, Russia, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, and several relatives and associates of President Donald Trump, alleging a grand conspiracy that harmed Democrats through WikiLeaks's publication of internal party emails during the 2016 presidential campaign. The 66-page lawsuit filed in Manhattan Federal Court on Friday lays out how the Trumps allegedly curried favor in Russia through their family businesses, and then Russians allegedly used those connections before the presidential election to disseminate the spoils from a cyber attack on the DNC. In the Trump campaign, Russia found a willing and active partner in this effort to disrupt the presidential election, the Democratic Committee alleges. Judge John G. Kotal, a Clinton appointee, will preside over the case. The Democratic Party alleges the conspiracy and the hacking hurt their relationship with voters, chilled donations, disrupted their political convention, and subjected their staffers to harassment. The lawsuit outlines nearly every known communication between Trump advisors and Russians. In all, it alleges a dozen crimes from racketeering and conspiracy to wiretapping and trade secret violations. Now, there's actually quite a bit of defendants named in this lawsuit, uh, ranging from Donald Trump Jr. to George Papadopoulos, Roger Stone, and even Julian Assange. So there's two things that I want to talk about with regard to the DNC lawsuit. First is the glaring hypocrisy. And second of all is the implications that this has on freedom of the press. So when it comes to their hypocrisy, um, my favorite part of the lawsuit is the claim that, quote, the hacking hurt their relationship with voters, chilled donations, and disrupted their political convention and subjected their staffers to harassment. So in other words, if WikiLeaks didn't expose them as the frauds that they are who rigged the primary, then everything would be peachy keen right now. Except that's not true. We already knew that the Democratic Party was rigging the primary against Bernie Sanders because their actions were brazen. Everything they did was calculative and deliberately intended to hurt Bernie Sanders. We saw that. You scheduled debates the weekend before Christmas. It was obvious. WikiLeaks just confirmed what we already knew. So they're essentially arguing here, don't blame us for what we did. Blame the messenger who exposed what we did and our crime against democracy. And think about the irony here. They're literally suing WikiLeaks for what they call rigging the election and interfering in the 2016 election because WikiLeaks exposed how they rigged an election. That's what they're suing WikiLeaks for. So by doing this, obviously, you know, it's nothing more than political grandstanding. And what they're trying to do is claim that this is more, you know, than them just trying to score cheap political points. This is really about democracy and fighting to protect elections. And DNC Chairman Tom Perez made the rounds on cable news to make sure that we knew just how much the Democratic Party cares about democracy. Chairman, why now? Why now? Three reasons, Chris. Number one, we don't know how long the criminal proceedings will take, and nor do we want to rush that. And so uh, we have to file in order to preserve our rights under the civil justice system, statute of limitations, things of that nature. So we have that legal imperative. Number two, over the course of the last year, I've done my homework. Uh, a year ago, it was clear to me that the Russians had hacked the DNC. And they did it with the purpose of helping Donald Trump and hurting the Democrats. But we didn't have the evidence a year ago connecting the Russians and the Trump campaign. We have that evidence now, and that's why we move forward. And thirdly, Chris, uh, I'm worried about the 2018 elections. There is no accountability for what the Russians did. And when they do things with impunity, because this administration won't hold them accountable, we've got to hold them accountable. That's what the civil justice system is about. It's about accountability. It's about deterrence. Our democracy is on fire, and we have to preserve our democracy. We've got to preserve full and fair elections. And that's a big part of what this is about. But the, but the entities aren't going to be held accountable before the 2018 midterms, right? I mean, I've, I've been around civil 
civil litigation a little bit, and boy, does that take a while. Well, absolutely, we won't finish the case before now, but we want to send a very, very clear signal. If you want to mess with elections here, there are going to be consequences. We are raising the cost of your interference. We know that this administration is Putin's poodle, and so they're not going to do anything. So we will continue to act. If you want to do that, if you're going to punch us, quite frankly, Chris, we're going to punch back. And that's what this uh, lawsuit is about. We are protecting our democracy. Uh, when you go after the, the right to vote, when you go after the institution of elections, uh, that is the essence of our democracy. So this wasn't simply an attack on the DNC. This was an attack on our democracy. Our democracy is at risk here. We have to make sure that the elections coming up in November are fair. And they they invaded us the last time. They hacked the DNC. They tried to influence the outcome of the election. There's no accountability in the White House. And why wouldn't they do it again? So I believe in doing your homework. And over the course of the last year, we have seen, I think, a mountain of evidence of collusion between the uh, campaign and the Russians to basically uh, affect our democracy. And uh, our democracy is at risk. This was an assault on our democracy, and we have to protect that. Uh, preserving our democracy uh, is priceless. And when you have elections that have been attempted, you've seen attempted interference in the past, they're going to do it again. That's what we believe in as Democrats. Elections should be fair. I understand people may agree and disagree, but you know what? We're fighting for them. <laughs> <laughs> You heard that right. Democrats are the ones fighting for free and fair elections. This is breaking news to me because I always thought that it was the Democratic Party that didn't care about democracy. Because as they claim to fight for free and fair elections, dozens of state Democratic parties still block independents from participating in Democratic Party primaries. They refuse to still abolish superdelegates, and they're crippling the campaigns of progressives across the country because state parties are continuing to cut off progressives' access to NGP Van. They're leaving progressives out of polling so that way they won't qualify for state debates when they do have them. They refuse to investigate ballot destruction in Broward County, Florida. And let's not forget that their attorneys literally just argued last year that Democrats Democratic Party bigwigs can get together in a smoke-filled room and pretty much unilaterally choose who the Democratic Party nominee should be if they wanted to do that. There's really no shortage of examples to demonstrate how little the Democratic Party still values democracy. And that's not even taken into account the fact that they brazenly rigged the primary against Bernie Sanders in 2016, so much so that current DNC Chairman Tom Perez had to fess up and admit that the primaries were rigged. Temporarily, of course, until he backtracked. I mean, this is a party that was shameless in the way that they did the bidding for Hillary Clinton. Everything from the debate schedule to superdelegates. I mean, they were shameless. And now we have Tom Perez going on cable news crying about how Russia attacked them by exposing how the DNC tried to stack the deck against Bernie Sanders. It's ridiculous. Now, in the midst of all of Tom Perez's insufferable political grandstanding that you saw there, the irony was apparently lost on him because everything that he said about how Russia interfered in the 2016 election is also applicable to what the DNC did. So literally all you have to do is change the word Russian to DNC with this quote. Uh, I'm worried about the 2018 elections. There is no accountability for what the Russians did. Well, let's change that. I'm worried about the 2018 elections. There's no accountability for what the DNC did. Still true, there's been no accountability. The DNC fraud lawsuit was dismissed, and they still won't even admit that they rigged the primaries in 2016. So if you actually care about democracy like you say you do, Tom, you have to prove it to us. You have to walk the walk. But the DNC is dragging its feet to just reduce superdelegates. The DNC Unity Reform Commission recommended a cut of superdelegates when they should be abolished entirely, so it was already a compromise, and now they're dragging their feet. They don't even want to do that. But here they are, claiming that they give a fuck about democracy. Get the fuck out of here. I mean, I, I can't take the hypocrisy. It's, it's insane. 
this is nothing more than political grandstanding. It's it's just a way for them to gin up support ahead of the midterm election. But it's not just about them trying to fundraise off of this, because it's obvious that that's what they're doing. But this actually has broader implications for the First Amendment and press freedom in this country, something that they also claim to care about. Because as The Intercept's Glenn Greenwald and Trevor Tim report, the DNC's suit, as it pertains to WikiLeaks, poses a grave threat to press freedom. The theory of the suit, that WikiLeaks is liable for damages it caused when it willfully and intentionally disclosed the DNC's communications, would mean that any media outlet that publishes misappropriated documents or emails, exactly what media outlets quite often do, could be sued by the entity or person about which they are reporting, or even theoretically prosecuted for it, or that any media outlet releasing an internal campaign memo is guilty of economic espionage. It is extremely common for media outlets to publish or report on materials that are stolen, hacked, or otherwise obtained in violation of the law. In October 2016, one month before the election, someone mailed a copy of Donald Trump's 1995 tax returns to the New York Times, which published parts of it, even though it is illegal to disclose someone's tax returns without the taxpayer's permission. In March of 2017, MSNBC's Rachel Maddow did the same thing with Trump's 2005 tax returns. In April of 2016, the Washington Post obtained and published a confidential internal memo from the Trump campaign. Media outlets constantly published private companies' internal documents. Just three weeks ago, BuzzFeed obtained and published a secret Facebook memo outlining the company's internal business strategies, the contents of which were covered by most major media outlets. So make no mistake about it, this sets a dangerous precedent. Because if they are actually successfully able to win this lawsuit, well, what does that mean for news outlets that want to publish information that was obtained illegally? That they won't really be able to do this. And understand the hypocrisy here. They're not in favor of anything being published with regard to their hacked emails, but when it comes to Donald Trump's tax returns, that's fair game. They haven't come out to denounce it. So they are so hypocritical. There are no words to describe the level of hypocrisy that this party continues to exude. It's just mind-boggling to me. And look, even Barack Obama knew that you can go after outlets, news outlets that published leaked info. Even Obama, even though he was against whistleblowers, he waged a war on whistleblowers. He didn't go after WikiLeaks when they published the information that Chelsea Manning brought to them. He went after Chelsea Manning when he found out that Chelsea Manning was their source. This is new. They want to go after the news outlet. They want to discourage news outlets from publishing anything that's obtained illegally when that's what news outlets do. So, this party, they are fundamentally broken. More specifically, the DNC is broken. But I mean, they are the leading organization for the Democratic Party. And understand that last week we learned that the DNC is still funneling money to Hillary Clinton's new super PAC onward together when they could be giving that money to state parties. Now, this lawsuit will cost potentially millions of dollars. More money that could be going to state parties. Now, when Tom Perez was asked about this and how he could justify spending money on this when state parties are still starved, well, he refused to answer the question. How much money is this going to cost the DNC? How much money are you taking away from 2018 to focus on 2016 in Russia? Chuck, we can't afford not to do this because when you look ahead and you see what, what was done before and what they're trying to do again, our democracy is at stake. It's hard to win elections when you have interference in elections. You Wisconsin, didn't answer. How much money is this lawsuit going to take we, this year? It, Millions? I don't know. I don't know the uh, amount of money that it will take, but I'll tell you, it's hard to put a price tag on preserving democracy. And you know what? That's why I concluded that it would be irresponsible of me not to do this. So, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know about the Democratic Party's priorities. That money could be going to state parties, which would then give that money to candidates and help Democrats get elected. But they don't care about getting Democrats elected. They're paid to lose. They're paid to lose. They don't care. Now, since this is clearly ridiculous, Tom Perez made sure that he <laughs> took extra steps to stick to the script this time. Take a look. Chairman, why now? Why now? Three reasons, Chris. Well, there are three reasons, Judy. Uh, well, there are three basic reasons. Number one, we don't know when uh, 
uh, Director Mueller will finish his investigation and he should take all the time he needs to do a thorough job. I don't know when Director Mueller's investigation is going to end, nor would I ever ask him because I want him to do a good thorough job. Over the course of the last year, I've done my homework. We've, We've done, done our, our homework. homework. Um, and then he said the Wendy Wasserman Schultz servers, I think yeah. he then <laughs> later corrected to Debbie Wasserman Schultz, um, a document held yeah. by the Pakistani mystery man and Clinton emails. What, the, the, the people you've sued have gotten your attention, I guess. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I, I saw that response, and it was kind of the greatest, greatest hits of, of all uh, their conspiracy uh, wild conspiracy theories. Those are almost the precise quotes we heard from the Nixon campaign in 1972. And the response when that lawsuit was filed was almost identical to what we saw today. Uh, so it seems like the Trump folks and the Nixon folks, uh, once again, there's yet another thing that they have in common. So look, what more do you need to know about the Democratic Party, the DNC? They're, they're frauds, they're hypocrites, they're the biggest hypocrites in the world, but you can never mention their hypocrisy, you can never mention the contents of that email. They were exposed, they were caught with their pants down, fucking over Sanders supporters. But they're the victims, and now they're suing because they've been so victimized. The sad news is that this lawsuit actually has a chance of going through. So we'll see. But, I mean... You'd think that this would be embarrassing for them, and some Democrats credit where it's due, like Claire McCaskill, are saying that this is nothing more than a silly distraction, because it is. So, in 2017, independent content creators on YouTube faced what's now widely known as the Adpocalypse, which was a YouTube advertiser boycott that was catalyzed by an article published in the Wall Street Journal, where they discussed how YouTube was displaying ads before racist and even extremist content, which then prompted advertisers like Pepsi, Walmart, and Dish Network to pull ads in their entirety from the website. Now, even though the adpocalypse is technically over, creators like myself are still suffering. We still never fully recovered. We're about 40 to 60% there on a good day. But for the most part, we are still hurting from the adpocalypse, and if it weren't for Patreon patrons, a lot of our shows would not be able to survive. But understand that the adpocalypse itself, just advertisers pulling ads from the site, that isn't the only issue, because the problems that resulted in the aftermath of the adpocalypse go much deeper than that. So for example, YouTube adjusted their algorithm to make it so sensitive that any and all subjects deemed even just mildly controversial are now automatically demonetized. So if you want to talk about Syria, if you want to talk about LGBT rights, those are all demonetized. Now, what the adpocalypse also did was it sped up the corporatization of YouTube, where the videos that are now being prioritized and recommended by YouTube's algorithm, they don't come from independent media news sites, they come from mainstream media news shows. So while our videos on Syria might be demonetized automatically, CNN's videos, on the other hand, will appear on YouTube's trending page for literal days at a time. And the reason why they're doing this is because it's safer for you YouTube to just simply place ads on CNN and not deprioritize them because corporate advertisers know that CNN's content is inoffensive for the most part. So the logic here is why take a chance with normal creators on YouTube, which is what this site was created for, when you can already have corporate friendly content that's already on the site and just promote that. That's what's happened since the adpocalypse. And now we see a headline from CNN where they are trying to spawn a new wave of demonetization and another advertiser boycott. Headline, exclusive, YouTube ran ads from hundreds of brands on extremist channels, ads from over 300 companies and organizations, including tech giants, major retailers, newspapers, and government agencies, ran on YouTube channels promoting white nationalists, Nazis, pedophilia, conspiracy theories, and North Korean propaganda, a CNN investigation has found. Now, first and foremost, understand that what they are claiming to have found here, these are the few instances... I'm assuming, where YouTube's algorithm had videos that just slipped through the cracks. But the overwhelming majority of the time, YouTube's algorithm catches this sort of extremist content and it demonetizes them. But they're saying here, nope, the problem, uh, you know, it still persists. So uh, the implication is maybe these large corporations that are currently advertising on YouTube, 
should boycott them once again. So they go on to state in the article, companies such as Adidas, Amazon, Cisco, Facebook, Hershey, Hilton, LinkedIn, Mozilla, Netflix, Nordstrom, and Under Armour may have unknowingly helped finance some of these channels via advertisers they paid for on Google-owned YouTube. U.S. tax dollars may have gone to the channels too, as from five U.S. government agencies such as the Department of Transportation and Centers for Disease Control appeared on the channels. Many of the companies that responded to CNN said they were unaware their ads had been placed on these channels and were investigating how they ended up there. One of the companies, Under Armour, is pausing its advertising buy on the platform after CNN notified the company its ads appeared on a white nationalist YouTube channel called A Wife with a Purpose. The incidents have raised questions about whether YouTube can adequately safeguard ads and brand's integrity or whether its automated systems mean that advertisers will always be at risk of such paid ad placements. Ads also appeared on the Jimmy Dore Show channel, a far-left YouTube channel that peddles conspiracy theories such as the idea that Syrian chemical weapons attacks are hoaxes. Wow. So, their intentions here are crystal clear. They're suggesting here maybe YouTube hasn't done enough to safeguard these brands from running uh, before these extremist content. So maybe they should pull out and they got what they wanted. Under Armour is one of the few companies that decided to pull out. And they also reached out to other companies to get a comment from them. Also kind of nudging them in the direction that they want them to go. So understand, they're trying to achieve two things here. First and foremost, make no mistakes about it, they want another advertiser boycott from YouTube because that hurts independent content creators. And simultaneously, they're trying to smear Jimmy Dore because, let's face it, Jimmy Dore is a competitor to CNN. Jimmy Dore is someone who has numbers that are comparable to CNN, a news network that has billions of dollars in resources. And understand just how dirty and despicable their smear of Jimmy Dore is. Jimmy Dore happens to be a peace activist, so they try to label him as a conspiracy theorist, but in actuality, they know that Jimmy Dore is not a conspiracy theorist, if they know anything about Jimmy Dore at all. But the reason why Jimmy Dore got their attention is because Jimmy Dore's videos on the same subject of Syria are actually getting more views than CNN. But his audience also approves of the job that he's doing, which is indicated by the insanely high like-to-dislike ratio you see on his videos about the topic. But when you compare that to the audience response that CNN garners, not only is their coverage disliked by a three-to-one margin, but this multi billion dollar cable news network could barely muster the same amount of views as Jimmy Dore, someone who's an independent media personality. Jimmy Dore scares them. He has something that they will never be able to garner. High numbers in the key demo, which is ages 18 to 54. That is the main audience that advertisers try to target. Now, when you look at our demographics on YouTube, 85% of our audience is comprised of the key demo. And I'm sure that Jimmy Dore's is probably similar. CNN's average viewer is within his or her 60s. So obviously, we are direct competitors to CNN. And now, since they can't beat us based on, you know, the journalism and the videos that they produce, they try to smear us and attack us instead. This isn't just attack an attack on Jimmy Dore, this is an attack on independent media collectively, because when you smear one of us, you smear all of us. Now, putting aside the aspect about how they're sleazily trying to smear their direct competition, and getting to the smear that they, you know, lobbed against Jimmy Dore, this is downright slander. And I think that Jimmy probably has legal grounds to sue them, because they put him in the same category as literal racists and pedophiles, and they labeled him as a conspiracy theorist, which is absolutely absurd. And look, let's get to Jimmy Dore's coverage of the Syrian chemical attack. This is from a segment that he recently posted. Here we are again. It remains mysterious. <laughs> you mean counterintuitive and stupid and transparently propagandistic? Is that That's what you mean? Trump vows quick attack. Why a quick attack? Because you got to do it before the evidence comes out. The same reason why yes. Bush wanted to order all the weapons inspectors out of Iraq before the truth came out. This is what warmongers do. So Jimmy Dore is saying basically the same thing that I said on this subject. 
Jimmy Dore is saying it's counterintuitive to assume that Assad is the one culpable for this recent chemical attack, you know, because that doesn't serve his interest. And furthermore, we haven't even conducted an investigation, but we're already concluding that we know the outcome before we see the evidence. So he's basically doing what journalists on CNN should be doing. But yet, they are smearing him as a conspiracy theorist because he dared to question the narrative that the Pentagon is trying to shove down our throats currently. But if you want to call Jimmy a conspiracy uh, theorist CNN, well, Wolf Blitzer recently had on a conspiracy monger that said the same thing that Jimmy Dore happened to say recently. Well, I think before you talk about sanctions, we ought to talk about, you know, what evidence is there that, the Ru that Russia was complicit in this attack? In fact, for that matter, I still look at the attack and say, you know, Assad either must be the dumbest dictator on the planet or maybe he didn't do it. I have yet to see evidence that he did do it. The intelligence agencies claim they have that evidence. But think about it. Does it make any sense? He's been winning the war for the last couple of years. The only thing that would galvanize the world to attack Assad directly is a chemical attack. It killed relatively few people compared to what can be killed with traditional bombs, traditional machine guns, traditional tanks. And so you wonder, really, what logic would there be for Assad to be using chemical weapons? Well, would you look at that? CNN is inviting on conspiracy theorist Rand Paul to say basically the same thing that Jimmy Dore said. Are advertisers going to boycott CNN now since they had on someone that question the dominant narrative in this country? Look, it's absolutely absurd, and the channels that they're pointing out here, like um, A Wife with a Purpose, when you look at that channel, it has 10,000 subscribers and garners a mere 1,000 views. Now, I don't know about this channel in particular, but let's say, hypothetically speaking, that this really is an extremist channel. Is it worth it because a couple of ads slip through the cracks to demonetize everyone on the platform? No, it's not. But to CNN, it absolutely is worth it because, again, they have an agenda. They want to take down their competitors. But the adpocalypse, it doesn't just hurt independent media. It hurts other content creators on YouTube. Uh, Ethan and Hila Klein of H3, they recently said that they barely make any money on YouTube anymore. These are people with millions of subscribers, and they could barely sub survive on this platform now because of demonetization. And here CNN is trying to do this again. They're trying to kick YouTubers while they're down because it suits their interests. They want those ads that are being displayed on YouTube. But the problem for CNN is that advertising dollars will always go to where the eyeballs are. And we have the key demographic, something you wish you could have. And that's not going to change because we're actually telling the truth. CNN is bullshitting you, and they're just straight up displaying government propaganda. They are letting press briefings from the Pentagon run uninterrupted for half an hour, not questioning the narrative at all, and that's what journalists are supposed to do. So this is journalistic malpractice. This is incredibly nefarious. CNN didn't disclose the conflict of interest behind this article. The underlying implication is, hey, advertisers, you don't have to worry about your ads being placed before extremist content on our show, so maybe you should direct your advertising dollars to us. They didn't explicitly say that, but this article reeked of that undertone. So this is an attack on independent media. They want another advertiser boycott. But understand this. Any time an advertiser boycott happens, independent news shows are able to survive now because of websites like Patreon. So you may be able to get us defunded on YouTube. You may be able to encourage them to make this algorithm even more sensitive so it demonetizes more of our videos, and that sucks. But we can survive this now because of Patreon, because of the grassroots, because there's more passion behind what we do than there ever will be for what you do. People do not like you, CNN. People do not trust you, CNN. But rather than trying to genuinely do better and improve, they choose to just crush their competition so people don't have any options. Well, it's not going to happen, CNN. I don't know if this is going to trigger another adpocalypse. I don't. It's too early to tell because last time when the Wall Street Journal article was published, it took a couple of weeks for it to really hit us hard. So I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know that we will survive this. And guess what? We're going to come out stronger than ever because our audience has our backs. Jimmy Dore's audience has his back. Your audience doesn't have your back, CNN.
So if you really want to compete with us, you actually have to do a good job. But since you are backed by large multinational corporations who advertise on your network, you can't do a good job. You produce corporate-friendly propaganda on your network, and that's why Americans hate you and don't trust you. So um, this is just, it's shameful, really. Um, I don't know what else to say about this. When I saw this, I was really rattled to see a friend of mine, Jimmy Dore, smeared in this way. CNN is the biggest joke in the country. Fuck you, CNN. MSNBC's Rachel Maddow has propelled herself to the number one spot in cable news, primarily by focusing on Russiagate more so than any other pundit in the country. And now other journalists see that and they're deciding to cash in on Russiagate themselves. But Russiagate and McCarthyism, generally speaking, it's not just being used to delegitimize the presidency of Donald Trump. It's also being used as a form of clickbait for some journalists and also as a means of discrediting progressive activism. Now we got another example of that this week when an NPR affiliate in Atlanta decided to smear Anoa Changa, who is a progressive that I know. I've been on her show. She's been on my show. Um, nobody really has the credibility and the passion that Anoa has, but yet one journalist decided to cash in on McCarthyism and smear her and call her credibility into question. So journalist Johnny Kaufman published an article titled, Atlanta Activist Uses Russian-Backed Media to Spread Message. And he writes, Anoa Changa is a progressive activist and political commentator in Atlanta. When I met her recently, Changa was preparing to record a segment for her own podcast and YouTube channel, The Way with Anoa. During the 2016 election, Changa often ended up speaking to media looking for a female supporter of Sanders. Since the election, she's been part of an online network formed by supporters of Sanders and former Green Party candidate Jill Stein. Changa is managing editor of a blog called Progressive Army, where some of the activists regularly post. But Changa's work as a commentator got more complicated after she took a call in 2016. As she remembers it, the call came from a producer at Sputnik Radio, a network funded by the Russian government. Sputnik has a website and broadcasts on both AM and FM in Washington, D.C. By agreeing to appear on two Sputnik programs, Changa gained something hard to find, a bigger platform to broadcast her political views. But Changa's association with Sputnik may put her credibility at risk while furthering Russia's effort to create chaos in the U.S. A report released in January by the FBI, National Security Agency, and CIA called Sputnik and the TV network RT, formerly Russia Today, part of Russia's state-run propaganda machine. Those platforms are set up for the sole purpose of promoting the Kremlin line, said Robert Ortung, an associate research professor of international affairs at the George Washington University. When progressive activists appear on Sputnik, that makes the outlet seem more legit, Ortung said. Russia may be using the activist frustrations about U.S. politics for its own purposes. The idea is to create as much chaos as possible, Ortung said, because the Russian see it as a zero-sum game where anything that weakens us is going to strengthen them. Changa doesn't plan to stop appearing on Sputnik programs. So, to summarize this article, Anoa is being used as a tool for the Russian government because she appeared on Kremlin-funded news shows to discuss issues pertaining to the United States that are incredibly important, like money and politics and police brutality. So if she discussed these same issues, but on a different news network, then she wouldn't be doing the bidding of Russia. But since she's talking about important issues on shows that receive funding from the Kremlin, well, now Anoa is suddenly being used as a proxy for Russia to cause chaos in the United States by raising awareness about these same important issues. Now, this article doesn't mention that Anoa also appeared on BBC, a network that receives funding from the UK government. Does that make her a tool of the UK government as well, or only because currently we are in a McCarthyist state in US politics and everyone is trying to cash in on Russian hysteria that her appearing on RT is problematic and controversial? See, if you're struggling to follow the logic of this journalist, you're not alone. It's because there is no logic to this journalist. He probably saw how Rachel Maddow became the number one news host in the country, 
by focusing on Russian hysteria, and he figured he'd exploit this phenomenon himself and try to propel himself maybe to a bigger spot in Atlanta to maybe get himself onto a mainstream uh, news network like MSNBC or CNN. Now, what's interesting to me is that this article was published just days after Ed Schultz explained how he now has more journalistic freedom and expression on RT, a Russian-funded news agency in America, than when he did at MSNBC. So all this journalist is trying to do is elevate his own career at the expense of Anoa by throwing her under a bus and suggesting that she's a Russian tool. So this journalist did get the attention he was yearning for, but unfortunately for him, it wasn't the type of attention he hoped he'd receive for this article because when he tweeted this out, he received an overwhelming amount of backlash with more than 250 comments denouncing his article as propaganda, dismissing it as complete and utter garbage because it is. Now, this article isn't just problematic because he used McCarthyism in order to smear and discredit a progressive activist that we all know and love, but the way he did it was a lot more sleazy because he essentially lied to Anoa. So, in a response on Forward, Anoa writes, I was pleased when in early March I was approached by an American public media reporter, Johnny Kaufman, after he ran across a piece of mine in The Nation called Please Stop Calling Black Activism Divisive. I was pleased that Atlanta's public radio would be interested in my work and happy to reach a wider audience. In fact, that was how Kaufman sold the piece. I have sometimes felt that my message is being distorted by mainstream press, and after a conversation about that with Kaufman, I agreed to be interviewed. I gave him hours of my time. My colleagues also gave freely of their time. I allowed him in my home. What he put out there in the world in a four-minute radio clip was a staggering smear of me, my work, and my integrity. That pretty much tells you everything you need to know about this so-called journalist. He had to lie to Anoa to gain access to her. Now, to give you a little bit more context, in that article that Anoa published in The Nation, she argues that it's harmful to allege that Russian-linked social media accounts have decided to infiltrate grassroots organizations like Black Lives Matter in order to sow discord in the U.S. So, Anoa, in this article, basically called out mainstream media outlets who used McCarthyism to discredit black activism by implying that black activists talking about race issues is divisive in the first place. I mean, the underlying implication of our McCarthyist media is that that it's not racism itself that's divisive. It's not the police brutality and state-sanctioned killings of people of color in this country that's divisive. It's people talking about those issues that are being the divisive ones. And Russia is using them as tools to sow discord in the United States, as if that discord wouldn't already exist had it not been for Russia. So that's what Anoa was essentially talking about in this article, and the journalist basically lied to Anoa and made it seem like he was also opposed to McCarthyist smears against black activists, when in actuality, he went into this knowing damn well that he would be doing the same exact thing himself. So he's not just a McCarthyist smear merchant, he's also a liar. Now I want to share to you what Anoa also had to say about this article. For this was Kaufman's biggest mistake, a fundamental lack of respect for the struggle of being a person of color trying to get a platform for racial and social justice causes. And it was this fundamental lack of respect that led him to see me as a boob manipulated cynically by the Russian government rather than a black woman making a canny choice about growing her audience where she can, which is obviously not at Atlanta Public Radio. Yeah, so I would highly encourage you to read Anoa's full response. It's really long, so I can't share it, but read her full response. I'll link to it down below. But... Man, Anoa is someone who I absolutely respect because she has these nuanced discussions about really complex issues that need to be had that you never see in the mainstream media. And this journalist smeared her for it. It's unbelievable. The state of media in this country has to be at an all-time low. It has to be. And... This article came out about a day before CNN decided to smear Jimmy Dore. So understand, old media is after new media. They don't like independent content creators because we are speaking truth to power. And we don't fall for what they deem as a trap. Again, I mean, the jig is up. 
Ed Schultz told us that he has more freedom on RT, as I stated, than he did on MSNBC. But I bet that this journalist thought that he could smear Anoa and basically use this piece as his audition to get on MSNBC because this is what they all want, right? They all want to get on the big three cable news networks, Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC. And the way that they try to do it is by destroying the credibility of progressive activists if it suits their needs. But guess what? It backfired. So keep it up because you're only making independent media stronger by trying to lob these illegitimate attacks against us. I think to anyone with even the slightest semblance of intelligence, it's pretty obvious that Sean Hannity is nothing more than a hack for the Republican Party. He's a propagandist for Republicans. And he's a supposed small government conservative who doesn't believe in a welfare state. But we're learning a lot more about Sean Hannity, that he actually is a bigger fan of welfare than he leads on. In fact, he's a welfare queen himself, because according to a report by The Guardian, by John Swain, when Sean Hannity was named in court this week as a client of Donald Trump's embattled legal fixer, Michael Cohen, the Fox News host insisted their discussions had been limited to the subject of buying property. I've said many times on my radio show, I hate the stock market. I prefer real estate. Michael knows real estate, Hannity said on television a few hours after the dramatic hearing in Manhattan, where Cohen is under criminal investigation. Hannity's chosen investment strategy is confirmed by thousands of pages of public records reviewed by The Guardian, which detail a real estate portfolio of remarkable scale that has not previously been reported. The records link Hannity to a group of shell companies that spent at least $90 million on more than 870 homes in seven different states over the past decade. The properties range from luxurious mansions to rentals for low-income families. Hannity is the hidden owner behind some of the shell companies, and his attorney did not dispute that he owns all of them. Dozens of the properties were bought at a discount in 2013 after banks foreclosed on their previous owners for defaulting on mortgages. Before and after then, Hannity sharply criticized Barack Obama for the U.S. foreclosure rate. In January 2016, Hannity said there were millions more Americans suffering under this president, partly because of foreclosures. Hannity, 56, also amassed part of his property collection with support from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a fact he did not disclose when praising Ben Carson, the HUD secretary, on his television show last year. The real estate holdings linked to Hannity are spread across more than 20 shell companies formed in Georgia. Each of the companies uses a variant of the same name, which combines the initials of Hannity's children. Public records show the companies have bought up dozens of properties in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, New York, North Carolina, Texas, and Vermont. The Georgia purchases were funded with mortgages for $17.9 million that Hannity obtained with help from HUD, which insured the loans under a program created as part of the National Housing Act. The loans, first guaranteed under the Obama administration, were recently increased by $5 million with renewed support from Carson's department. So understand, this exposes Sean Hannity as a fraud, as a hypocrite, as a sleazeball. As he lambasts the poorest people in the country, saying that they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps and they shouldn't take gov government money, they should get off of welfare, here he is, taking millions of dollars from HUD and also failing to disclose conflicts of interest. So when he had on Ben Carson, he didn't tell Americans, as the article stated, or tell his viewers more specifically, that there's this huge relationship between him and HUD. He also, when he talked about Michael Cohen, Donald Trump, and his lawyer, he didn't say, Michael Cohen's also representing me as well. That's what you call a failure of a journalist. That's what you call someone with zero journalistic integrity. Now, I already knew, and most of us already knew, that Sean Hannity had no integrity, and he was nothing more than a hack for the Republican Party and really a smear merchant for the right. And Sean Hannity makes $36 million per year, yet... He's receiving government assistance to purchase multiple homes when the overwhelming majority of millennials, people in my generation, can't even afford their first home because of student loan debt. But yet, this multi-millionaire is taking government money 
and simultaneously denouncing people and criticizing people and looking down on people who also take government money. And in addition to all of that, this guy had the nerve to praise Trump and Carson's push for privatization as he took money to enrich himself personally. What a fraud. Is there a bigger fraud in news media? This is a guy who was number one for a really long time before Rachel Maddow surpassed him. He was number one in cable news. And he's a fraud. I mean, everything he talks about, about small government values and conservatism, is nothing more than rhetoric. He doesn't believe what he's espousing. Otherwise, he wouldn't take government money to enrich himself and build this real estate empire. So look, Sean Hannity is someone who I don't understand why he has any viewers, why 100% of his audience hasn't left him yet. Because after knowing these details, after knowing that he failed to disclose crucial information that affected his integrity while reporting on these types of to uh, topics, I mean, he's lying to you. If you're a viewer of Sean Hannity, he's lying to you. He's deceiving you specifically by refusing to disclose this conflict of interest. And he calls out other journalists for not having integrity when he himself has no integrity whatsoever. What a fraud Sean Hannity is. The parent company of MSNBC, as you all know, is Comcast, who was also voted the most hated company in America by consumers multiple times. So in an attempt to boost the perception that Americans have of them, they decided to use their news organization, MSNBC, to do a seven minute long puff piece for them. So what they did presumably is force their employees over at MSNBC to talk about just how wonderful Comcast is. So they brought on David Cohen, who is the senior executive VP for Comcast, and they talked about how wonderful Comcast is, and it was it was very Orwellian, and Adam Johnson Affair said that this was Sinclair Light, and I think that that's true, that's pretty accurate. Because after the uh, Sinclair scandal, after the Ed Schultz expose on MSNBC, it's clear that these hosts probably weren't talking up Comcast on their own accord. I think that they were probably forced to do it. So uh, I shortened the clip, we can't show the whole seven minute long segment, but here's the most, I guess you could say disturbing parts. Tomorrow marks a big event here as we celebrate Comcast Cares Day. Now in its 17th year, it is believed to be the nation's largest single day corporate volunteer event. And once again, the initiative is locking arms with one of the world's leading nonprofits, Global Citizen. It's all aimed at exploring new opportunities for volunteering, fundraising, and taking action to help stamp out poverty. Joining us now, Senior Executive Vice President of Comcast Corporation and the company's Chief Diversity Officer, David Cohen, and CEO of Global Citizen, Hugh Evans, also with us, host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, the Rev Al Sharpton. So um, let's start with you guys. What, why do we do this as a company? So I, I think we do this as a company because um, as a big company, as a big corporation, we certainly appreciate that we have a responsibility to give back to the communities and to try and improve the communities where our employees and our customers live and work. And um, when we're organized like this and we can do 17 years of this incredible day of service, which has a huge impact on one day, but is really a celebration of the fact that we care every day of the year and give our employees an outlet to volunteer. Um, you know, we'll have over 100,000 employees, members of their families and nonprofit partners volunteering tomorrow. Um, at over a thousand projects in more than 20 countries. Wow. So it's really become a global effort. And part of that I tribute to Hugh and our partnership with Global Citizen mm -hmm. and his ambitions to, um, to for, for Global Citizen, but for partners of Global Citizen like us to help make these efforts have a global impact and not just a domestic impact. You know, the, uh, the level of awareness that uh, this brings is so important. The year of Mandela campaign, you know, it's, it's striking to me how we don't teach our own history in this mm. country. And Nelson Mandela, such a global figure, his life, the impact his life has had, and you're carrying on that now. Absolutely, Mike. So 
In his final speech at Trafalgar Square in 2005, Nelson Mandela said this famous phrase. He said, we could be the generation to end extreme poverty. He said that poverty is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. That's why we're so proud to partner with Comcast, because for the last five years, Global Citizen has joined forces with Red Nose Day, with Comcast and MSNBC to really drive citizen action on a global level and also on a local level. The fact that there's going to be, you know, the largest, single largest national corporate volunteering event taking place tomorrow, powered by Comcast, driving citizen action in schools, in community groups, you know, planting trees, taking action for the environment, but also for civil society is really powerful. And this year, Global Citizen has set our, set our sights on trying to drive a campaign that really honors the legacy of Nelson Mandela. The magic of what has been done with Global Citizens and what Comcast has done from a civil rights community perspective, when I first started talking to David Cohen, I was like, okay, right. But since I've had a show here and I'm here every day, this is part of the culture. People in this building and around the Comcast world are excited about doing what they're going to do April 21st. This is, what I think, the way we can bring the world to where Mandela wanted us, where corporations don't become expansive and influential just for personal wealth, but for a purpose, right. so that we have the ability to do good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what tomorrow will be. And, and by the way, our our employees feel this. Absolutely. This is the best day of the year for Comcast because our employees want to be out in the community. So David, 30 ourselves. seconds. 30 seconds. Give us a great story from last year, how life changed. Just one so bet my, I have so many great Comcast yeah. Cares Day stories, but um, I was at a site last year where we were building a computer lab in a school. Um, and, you know, the kids are around, their parents are around. We have our technicians there. And uh, near, the, near the end of the project, I'm surrounded by a group of the parents. Half of them are crying. So you have no idea what a difference this is making um, in our community. And without Comcast, we'd have no ability to have this level of teaching, engagement, and helping to bring our kids into the digital age. All right, Comcast Cares Day, a day that makes all of us proud to work here and work for you. So what you just saw was the bulk of that clip. And throughout that entire segment, not once did MSNBC disclose that Comcast is the parent company for their network. Yes, towards the end, the host did say that she works for Comcast, but it was really brief and passing. I don't think that they made it clear enough that there is a conflict of interest here. There's literal bias. They didn't make it clear enough. And the irony here is that that was on Morning Joe, who just a couple of weeks ago referred to the Sinclair scandal as an embarrassment to journalism. And here they are doing what is an obvious propagandist puff piece for their parent company, who happens to be the most hated company in the country, not only because they have terrible anti-consumer business practices and monopolies, but because they spend millions of dollars lobbying Congress to repeal net neutrality, freedom on the internet. Now, when it comes to Comcast Cares Day, let's say, hypothetically speaking, that this organization or this effort really does make a difference on people's lives. Well, that doesn't change the fact that it's damage control, nor does it detract from all of the other awful things that Comcast does. And these types of PR stunts are meant to shield the most vile corporations in America from criticism. That's obvious, because whenever someone calls out how the Koch brothers are buying off Republican politicians so that way they'll deregulate the industries that they are involved in what's the first thing you hear oh well you can't criticize the Koch brothers because you know they donate to cancer research okay well two things can be true simultaneously we can commend them for donating to cancer research um, and universities and whatnot but we can also condemn them for what they're doing and their role that they're playing in killing the planet and they're doing this because they want to cultivate goodwill among the American people because they are fucking us over and they know that we don't like them. So it's true here as well with Comcast. They're doing this because they know everyone hates them. Now I want to get to some parts that really stood out to me. They explicitly compared Comcast to Nelson Mandela in this clip multiple times. Sharpton said, This is the way I think we can bring the world to where Mandela wanted us, where corporations don't become expansive and influential just for personal wealth, but for a purpose. Al, 
what the fuck are you talking about? You do realize that you are comparing Comcast to Nelson Mandela, right? You're basically shitting all over Nelson Mandela's legacy here by doing that. You know that, right? You'd think that a civil rights activist would know this, but apparently he doesn't know that. You're comparing a company that wants to kill freedom on the internet so they can censor voices they don't like. Voices against their company and also political voices they don't like. You're comparing that disgusting, vile organization to Nelson Mandela. What the fuck is wrong with you? Now, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention the softball at the end there <laughs> where the host <laughs> was like, Hey, uh, David, 30 seconds. Give us a great story from last year, how a life changed. And just, you know, threw that softball at him. And you could tell that when the Comcast executive answered this question, it was scripted. He knew that this question was coming in advance. Because he was like, oh, you know, I have so many great Comcast stories, but here's this one that I happen to know immediately. I don't have to take any time whatsoever to think about what I want to say or to think of a story since there's so many great ones. I just know exactly which story I want to use. So you knew in advance that they were going to ask you that question and you came up with your answer. It was pre-planned, right? I mean, these are your employees, of course. Of course you knew what they were going to ask you. Of course you knew that they were going to lob you a bunch of softballs. I'm sure that you probably coerced them into doing that. They're not even worried about how we're going to view this segment. It's just blatant propaganda and they don't even care how it looks. They have zero self-awareness. They have zero journalistic integrity. They didn't even challenges presumably and say look this this just seems like a bad idea it's in bad taste uh, comcast is our parent company so obviously there's a conflict of interest this is probably this seems like propaganda i mean i'm sure they didn't challenge them maybe because they were afraid that they were going to lose their jobs corporate media comcast msnbc these are not trustworthy news organizations and companies they have one goal that is to increase their profits. MSNBC only talks about news so long as it doesn't offend their corporate advertisers or their parent company. Let me ask you this. Why did MSNBC not talk about net neutrality? It was the biggest issue in the country for several months. They didn't cover it at all. And when they did cover it, their coverage was atrocious. I talked about this last year. Well, it's because... Their parent company, Comcast, has lobbied relentlessly to kill net neutrality. So this is nothing more than propaganda, and it really, I mean, <laughs> this stands out, I think, as maybe the go-to example of propaganda in this country and how parent companies of news networks control their hosts. It's not just Sinclair. I think that Sinclair is probably a more brazen example, but MSNBC they're doing the same thing. They're doing the bidding for their parent company, Comcast. And that's obvious with this clip. MSNBC's Joanne Reed recently dedicated 11 minutes of her show to discuss potential 2020 presidential contenders. And in this segment, she brought on Al Sharpton, who spoke about potential presidential candidates that recently gave speeches at his National Action Network. Now, among those discussed were Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Kirsten Gillibrand, Joe Biden, but conspicuously absent from the list of people they discussed, Bernie Sanders. So I can't play for you the entire 11 minute clip, but here's the Cliff Notes version. If you're hoping to win the Democratic nomination for president, there are a few things you have to do. Write an autobiographical book, appear on the Sunday shows to get your name ID out there, and maybe zero in on a signature issue or two. And seek an audience with the Reverend Al Sharpton. And while 2020 may seem like a long way off, prospective Democratic nominees are already getting the Sharpton primary in gear. Several likely prospects have been spotted at the National Action Network's convention this week here in New York City. Ahead of the convention, Reverend Al sat down with potential 2020 candidate, former Vice President Joe Biden. If Donald Trump gets by the Mueller uh, investigation, Joe Biden against Donald Trump is really about the soul of America. I would just say we are fundamentally different. What would make Joe Biden really consider running in 2020 for president? Uh, I, I'm really hoping that 
some other folks step up. I think we have some really good people. Did you get the sense that Joe Biden thinks there's someone other than him that can win? I think that he has not clearly seen who that is yet, and I think that troubles him. There's a long history of uh, people who wind up in the White House speaking at the National Action Network conference President Obama did when he was Senator Obama. Now, you this year have a lot of people that a lot of folks are, are focused on. Kamala Harris might be uh, the most prominent. You also had Kirsten Gillibrand there. But let's play Kamala Harris's interview uh, with you and talk about her on the other side. The offices that truly make a difference every day include these congressional offices, include these Senate offices, and right now we've got a lot of people up in 2018 in November, just 200 days from now, and we've got to make sure that we do the right thing with those elections. Now I want to stop right there to give you some additional context because they're specifically talking about 2020 presidential contenders that spoke at the National Action Network. So maybe it's the case that Bernie Sanders just didn't show up to this event. Except when you go to the official National Action Network's website, there he is, front and center. And would you look at that, Bernie Sanders actually did attend this event, and yes, he spoke there. But throughout the course of this entire 11 minute segment, in a video clip they posted to YouTube literally titled, Who are the top 2020 contenders? Bernie Sanders was missing from this discussion. But those of you who tuned in to learn more about Bernie Sanders potentially will be happy to know that Bernie Sanders finally did make his debut on this segment, albeit in passing when <laughs> Al Sharpton mentioned him, um, his name basically, just just said Bernie Sanders. And they also um, showed a picture of Bernie Sanders alongside Al Sharpton at this event as well. Kamala Harris probably has the most sort of Obama-like hype around her, but she isn't that well known. And other than her really great questioning on the day as, as a senator, um, do you sense beyond that some sort of fire in the belly or an X factor that could make her a 2020 prospect? You know, uh, I've sensed yesterday a real passion Kamala Harris spoke yesterday, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders, Andrew Cuomo was the other day. All of them have come. And uh, one, because not a Sharpton primary, but that's what the media calls. It's Nash Action Network's convention. Yep. It ends today. And they have to have the black vote. That's it. And we are one of the organizations, as is the NAACP and Urban League, but we convened first because we convened in April because we tried to do it in the month Dr. King was killed because mm -hmm. we're a King-based group. And they can't win without the black vote. I felt a real passion from uh, Kamala Harris about really fighting for issues like criminal justice as well as the economy and other things. And we made it clear she was a prosecutor. We may not agree on everything. Right. Obama was not as well known as right. he became. Yep. And he won in terms of National Action Network forms of the different speakers. Mm -hmm. And look where he went. Now, I'm not saying it was because he came to us, but sure. he really did. I have to, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Rudy Giuliani. So, <laughs> His face was on the screen for exactly six seconds, and yes, I counted. But thankfully, that wasn't the only mention throughout the segment, because if you fast forward all the way to the 9 minute, 21 second mark, Bernie's face appears again. Actually, tomorrow, who do you have on tomorrow? Are you Do you have on... Uh, I have on, I do, I show tomorrow the interviews that I did with each of the candidates. So okay. on Politics Nation in the morning, you can see the in-depth interviews because I went after them on specifics and I wanted them to tell us why we can trust that they will do this. So I can't help but ask, knowing that there was a media blackout of Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign and now learning about how the president of MSNBC literally called Ed Schultz and told him not to cover the launch of Bernie Sanders' 2016 campaign. I have to ask, did you get a call from Phil Griffin, Joy? Did he tell you not to talk about Bernie Sanders? Because we know that on MSNBC, they like to interview Bernie Sanders. Chris Hayes has him on pretty frequently. But when it comes to Bernie Sanders running for president, is MSNBC still doing everything in their power to withhold information about him running? It's a legitimate question, knowing that MSNBC's president doesn't want anyone to know about Bernie Sanders' campaign. And also, I can't help but wonder if, you know, maybe this isn't the president of MSNBC. Maybe it's just because Joy Reid is biased. 
I think that both things are probably true. Both of those are in play here. It's both Joy Reid's bias that didn't want to talk about Bernie being a potential 2020 contender, and also the president of MSNBC who probably nudged her in that direction, if not just didn't explicitly call her and say, hey, I know you're talking about 2020 contenders. You better not include Bernie Sanders. And if you mention him, just throw a pick on there for six seconds so people won't think you're biased. Well, we're on to you, Joy Reid. We're on to you. You once said that Bernie Sanders was the great clairvoyant voice on Twitter. You said this in, what, 2010? And now all of a sudden, when you have your own show on MSNBC, a network that hates Bernie, you're trying to hide information about his campaign. Again, the title of this segment, who are the top 2020 contenders, didn't include Bernie Sanders. What many believe, rightfully so, is the front runner. I mean, if they're going to be biased, you'd think that they'd go to at least a little bit greater lengths to hide it, but Joy Reid doesn't care, MSNBC doesn't care. Look, if you're getting your news from cable news, you're doing it wrong. You're not being educated. And if you're learning about anything, it's certainly within the parameters of what corporate America thinks is acceptable. So Joy Reid is absolutely the biggest hack and perhaps the definition of a sellout because, again, she was a Bernie supporter until she got hired by MSNBC. And now she's probably making millions of dollars knowing that she has to deny us information about Bernie Sanders running for president. Well, look. If you are a journalist, if you're a news pundit, your job is to inform your viewers. So by withholding information about Bernie Sanders running for president, you're misleading them. You're doing propaganda at the behest of the corporate advertisers on MSNBC's network, probably who don't want Bernie Sanders to be president because he wants to raise their taxes. Joy Reid is just pathetic. Um, anyone who takes her seriously now, I don't take you seriously. So, you all know that I tend to criticize mainstream news outlets like CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, but lately, CNN and MSNBC in particular have really been hitting it out of the park. For example, CNN recently released a bombshell news report about how Walmart is currently testing a new dress code that would allow their workers to wear blue jeans. I mean, talk about hard-hitting journalism. <laughs> So obviously I'm being facetious, if you couldn't already tell, they're at an all-time low in terms of shittiness, and this week, the news Brian's, that includes Brian Stelter and Brian Williams, decided to demonstrate to us just how useless they really are, because they decided to hold Trump accountable. Did they talk about him wanting to wage a war on the poor? Did they talk about his drone wars? Did they talk about perhaps how he hasn't really said anything about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan that's still going on? No, they decided to call him out because he misspells words. I'm not joking about that. Let's talk about some of the administration's um, sloppiness and, and, and why this matters. Accuracy is part of the job for doctors, for engineers, for reporters, for lots of people. Uh, every time I make a mistake or I have to run a correction, I am mortified. But it doesn't seem to be true for the White House. The president's spelling mistakes are infamous at this point. There's a couple from the past couple of days here. Shady Comey <laughs> misspelled on Twitter. Uh, there's also factual errors. Let me show you one about Key West. The president went to Key West on Thursday. Then on Saturday, he said, I had a great time there yesterday. He meant two days ago. You know, we could go on and on with these. A special counsel spelled the wrong way instead of the special counsel Mueller. There's all of these examples of the errors that he shares on Twitter. And I think it trickles down to the staff as well. I thought the, the most embarrassing error of the week was in a statement uh, on the occasion of Barbara Bush's passing. Uh, the date was wrong on the statement. It said 2017. It meant 2018. This was a statement that could have been written days ahead of time. I would have been happy to proofread it for them or fact check it for them. I, I just wonder what the panel thinks of this because I, I know this is not the most important issue in the world, but I do think it's important because it speaks to if you can't get the small stuff right, can you get the big stuff right, like a North Korea summit? Good job. You got him, Brian. Man, that is what I call journalism right there. Focusing on the misspellings of the president. Way to really show him. I mean, this is <laughs> it's a fucking joke. What are we doing? I, I mean, I guess I can give Brian Stelter credit for at least having the awareness to contemplate how important this really is. But I mean, he still decided to go along with it. 
And there's another news, Brian, that did the same thing. Brian Williams, he also decided to call out Donald Trump for misspelling words. Let's call them the little things that we're still getting used to about this presidency. Take, for example, the tone and tenor, the subject matter and content and spelling of the president's tweets. And it's true, we really shouldn't refer to them as tweets. That diminishes what they are, which is short presidential statements. They may be at times ill thought out. They may be done on the fly and at all hours. But the folks at Real Press Sec Bot on Twitter, they may have the right idea. They present each Twitter utterance by this president reformatted as an official statement by the president laid out on letterhead the way statements from the president used to look. The problems today were spelling errors and the wrong name. We have already this hour recorded tonight's two misspellings of the word counsel, as in special counsel. And earlier today, you could hear English teachers all across the country saying in unison, if you're going to call the former FBI director Shady James Comey, spell Shady correctly without the E. It has still not been corrected. Tonight, it was Florida Congresswoman and former DNC head Wendy Wasserman Schultz. The problem with that is her name is Debbie Wasserman Schultz. While it was later corrected, Maggie Haberman of The New York Times wondered if the president was perhaps thinking of the late great New York playwright Wendy Wasserstein. And while we may never know, it's all a part of a new dynamic, this still new world of the Trump presidency, as yet another week in the Trump presidency comes to an end. If I had to concoct a parody in my mind to demonstrate just how weak and ineffectual the media is at holding Donald Trump accountable, it would look like that segment that you just saw. They're not choosing to call out Donald Trump or the Republican Party for... Things that really matter. They're focusing on misspellings. That's what they're dedicating their time to. To Brian Williams, Donald Trump misspelling words is more offensive than him bombing countries that didn't attack us. Because we all remember that Brian Williams was really excited about the beautiful bombs that Trump decided to drop on Syria in 2017. We see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Um, and they are beautiful pictures of, uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield. So together, I think that these two clips with the news brines, it summarizes the state of media in this country. Attack Trump for any and everything possible that doesn't actually have an effect on our lives. If he's going to wage a war on the poor and impose these draconian requirements for welfare recipients, we don't have to dedicate much time to that. If he's going to misspell words, however, we're going to call him the fuck out for that because that is not acceptable. You're the president. Spell words right, goddammit. That's, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. That's why I put the caption, I hate myself. Because you know that these corporate tools can't be happy with what they're doing. They didn't leave their job thinking, man, I really hit it out of the park that day. You know that they hate what they're doing. You know that they're phonies. They know that they're frauds. Brian Stelter had the self-awareness to realize, yeah, I might kind of look like an idiot by talking about something that is completely inconsequential, but I'm going to do it anyway. I mean, you, you can't feel good about this. This isn't journalism. This is self-parody at this point. How low will the media go before they just lose all of their viewers? I don't understand how anyone watches CNN. In fact, I don't know anyone who actually tunes into Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, unironically, who actually just watches it because they enjoy it. I don't know anyone. And again, I'm in a progressive bubble, but I mean, this is just, this is laughable. I mean, what else do I have to say about this? You don't even need the commentary. These clips speak for themselves. They're willing to call out Trump for everything that doesn't actually matter. The gubernatorial election in the state of Alabama is now well underway, 
and the former Chief Justice of Alabama, Sue Bell Cobb, is running to be the governor of Alabama. Now, she recently had a town hall with potential voters where she allowed them to ask her questions. Now, unbeknownst to her, someone showed up who cares deeply about progressive policy issues. That individual is Ashley Hudson, who also is the co-host of Establishment Exiles. So Ashley decided to ask her potential future governor two very basic questions. And Sue had what I think can be considered her Aleppo moment because her answers were embarrassing. Take a look. Um, as our gubernatorial candidate and as a Democrat um, espousing the values of progress, democracy, inclusiveness, um, I have two questions. Um, one touches on something you just said about getting money out of judicial elections. My first question is, how, how do you feel about money and politics in general, campaign finance? Do you, will you, will you take, be taking corporate or PAC money? That's my first yes, question. Yes, I take and PAC money. I take, I take I, money. But the deal is, and just let, can I, and I'm going to let you have another question, but yes. can I answer that? Is that, yes, I've taken PAC money. And, yet, and not nearly what my opponents have taken, <laughs> um, that's for sure. But yes, I'm taking corporate impact money. But the question is, is is it going to have an impact? Are they going to dictate, or am I going to be independent of that money? And I'm telling you, I will be as independent as any governor has ever been. On the issue of campaign finance reform, we, we've got to do something about citizens you know, Question two: um, At the state level, would you be support supporting a Medicare for All initiative? Meta Medicare for All. All right, Medicare for All. In universal. Have to be educated Single payer. Single payer. Single payer. Some state. Federal. Some states. Some, no, some states are trying to implement it. I'm wondering if Al at Alabama's level, if it's something you would support. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. The, we, will, we are going to be. I need to learn more about that because I believe that that's a federal, a federal issue, but. If Medicaid, if we can get Medicaid expanded, yes, I, I have that. That's the first I, step to that. Words, I cannot even put it into words what, what it would be if we, we could be. I don't even know what to say about that. Wow. Just wow. So. <laughs> Let's get to the first part where Ashley asked her if she would be taking corporate PAC money. She said, yes, I will be taking corporate PAC money. I'm glad she was honest about that. Thank you for that, Sue. But she said, I assure you, it's not going to influence my decisions in any way, shape, or form. I will remain independent from corporate influence. Really, Sue? How are we supposed to believe you when the rest of the Democratic Party establishment is obviously doing the bidding of corporate donors. How are we supposed to believe you when studies have shown that money in politics is corrupting? A 2014 Princeton University study by Drs. Gillens and Page found that normal Americans have a statistically insignificant impact on policy outcomes, whereas economic elites and corporations, they do have an impact on policy outcomes. So how are we supposed to believe that you're going to be the lone exception here that won't be influenced by corporate money? We're not supposed to believe that. You're bullshitting us, Sue. And I don't think anyone's going to believe what you're saying. So I, I like the fact that Democrats have taken an unequivocal stand against Citizens United. But that's not enough. It's not like Citizens United marked the start of the corrosive influence money has on our elections. It goes back to the 70s with Buckley v. Vallejo. I mean, money in politics has become an issue over the last few decades, that has basically ruined democracy in this country. So, to just say Citizens United should be overturned, that's good, but it's not enough. It's not enough at all. It's like saying that 
Obamacare is an adequate substitution to Medicare for All. That's not the case. But getting to her answer on Medicare for All, Ashley asked her whether or not she'd support Medicare for All at the state level, and she said she didn't know what Medicare for All is. Sue. <laughs> I don't believe you, okay? I, I absolutely do not believe that the former chief justice gubernatorial candidate in Alabama doesn't know what Medicare for All is or never heard of that. And she really gave us reason to not believe that she didn't know about that because she said, oh, that's a federal issue. Well, if you know it's a federal issue, then clearly you know what it is. And that's not what Ashley asked you. She didn't ask whether you think Medicare for All is a federal issue. She asked whether or not you'd be willing to do what other states are doing and consider Medicare for All at the state level. And she decided to play dumb instead in order to avoid Ashley's question. And she said, oh, the Medicaid expansion, if we could get that, that would be amazing. Of course that would be amazing. Of course. Nobody's denying that. But you have to understand that Obamacare alone will not suffice. Long term, it will not suffice. It was a band-aid, but it doesn't solve the healthcare crisis in America. Unless we have Medicare for all, people in this country, people in the state of Alabama will continue to go bankrupt and die. You have to get the profit motive out of healthcare. A Goldman Sachs executive recently asked whether or not curing patients is good for their profit motive or something along those lines, something just outrageously scandalous. You cannot have a healthcare system where profit is the guiding motive. You have to take the profit incentive out so we care more about delivering healthcare, not profits to health insurance companies and healthcare providers. So this was one of the few town halls where I really was scratching my head because usually if you ask a Democrat about Medicare for All, They'll, you know, do this tap dance around, oh, you know, I'm, I'm about really focusing on defending the Affordable Care Act currently, so I don't want to focus on Medicare for All until we really can make sure that Obamacare is safe. She just straight up said, you know what, I don't know what that is. Playing dumb, completely. Nobody believes you, so you know what this is. If you don't know what Medicare for All is, honestly, and you were being genuine there, you shouldn't be running for governor. How can you... Register as a Democrat, run to be a governor for the Democratic Party, and not know about a policy that over 75% of the party's base wants. It's unacceptable. So, I've said it once, I'll say it again. I have absolutely no problem giving credit to Democrats where it's due. And Chuck Schumer, even though he supported Donald Trump's decision to bomb Syria... He did something positive by championing the idea of decriminalizing marijuana. Now, would I like him to go further and just outright legalize marijuana? Would I like him to include a provision in his bill that expunges the records of people who have previous marijuana felonies and convictions? Yes, I would. But I mean, it's certainly a step in the right direction. So, I mean, these marginal improvements that are made by Democrats, I think that they're important. And we have to recognize it so that way they continue to do this, maybe if they see um, that we're praising them for it, you know, positive reinforcement. But by and large, make no mistake about it, Democrats are still completely lost. And we know that based on the things that they choose to rally around politically. Russiagate, Stormy Daniels, and their messaging for 2018 uh, that we're learning about what they're going to talk about and focus on it still shows that they're lost because they're choosing to focus on the Republican Party's corruption. Now, is the Republican Party corrupt? Yes. Unmistakably, they are corrupt. They are the, I would argue, the most corrupt political organization in the history of American politics. But what else is true about that? Democrats are also corrupt. So how can you call out the Republican Party's corruption if you yourself are beholden to your biggest financial backers. Well, they're going to do it anyway. 
So according to Amanda Turkle of HuffPost, Democrats are looking back to the last time they took control of the House for lessons on what may work this year, and they're starting to narrow in on a major theme, the Republican culture of corruption, cronyism, and incompetence. In 2006, Democrats won majorities in both the House and Senate, breaking the hold Republicans had on Congress for more than a decade. In 2006, the scandals dripped out bit by bit. Republicans watched them pile up, but still thought they might be able to keep the House until September when the Mark Foley scandal broke. The news that the GOP congressman from Florida had been sending sexually explicit text messages to teenage boys was the final nail in the coffin. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi is bringing back her 2006 reframe for this cycle. It first appeared in an April 6th statement calling for the resignation of Environmental Protection Agency head Scott Pruitt, saying he was a part of the Trump administration's culture of corruption, cronyism, and incompetence. It then popped up later that day in one of her press releases, and then three days later in a letter to her colleagues about their priorities in the coming months. In her weekly press conference the following day, she used the phrase twice, reminding reporters of that earlier election. Some may recall that in 2005-2006, one of our mantras during the campaign was to drain the swamp, to end the Republican culture of cronyism, corruption, and incompetence, and that is exactly what we did. The president has misappropriated that term of art drain the swamp and what does he do but have an administration that is wallowing in it now again i want to reiterate the fact that republicans are undoubtedly corrupt donald trump's administration is undoubtedly swampy but simply for one even if the democratic party wasn't corrupt pointing out the republican party's corruption is not an adequate substitute for their lack of policy ideas Marijuana legalization or decriminalization, uh, more specifically, that is a huge step in the right direction. But we want Medicare for all. We want student loan debt cancellation. We want a $15 federal minimum wage. We want tuition-free public colleges and universities. You can't just ignore all the things that we want and expect us to come out and support you only by focusing on Republican corruption. Because, yes, it is the case that Republicans are corrupt, but that doesn't change or fix the problems that we still have in this country. Now, again, I can't not point out their hypocrisy because as they lambast Republicans for being corrupt, I mean, they rigged a primary in 2016. That was one of the biggest scandals our country has ever seen. I mean, they're doing borderline quid pro quos for their corporate donors. Ruben Kiwan of Nevada is being forced into retirement, literally, for sexually harassing women. I mean, if you're gonna talk the talk, you better damn well make sure that you are able to walk the walk, but Democrats, they can't walk the walk. So everything that they do is either hypocritical or ironic, and they just, they don't see it. They don't see that we have the same perception of them as they have, you know, of Republicans. They need to fundamentally change the way that they do politics. We thought that Obama would do that when he championed this idea of hope and change and, you know, not doing politics as usual, we believed him, but he lied to us. And with that success, you'd think that Democrats would look at Obama's 2008 campaign and see, well, you know, maybe voters really do want change. Maybe the electoral victory of Donald Trump in 2016 is a huge sign that voters are tired of the establishment. Maybe we should do things differently, but they don't see it. They don't. Not only are they out of touch, but they are corrupt. And until they break away from the chains that their corporate donors have locked them in, we're not going to see fundamental change, you know, uh, for the Democratic Party. And it's sad. A couple of weeks ago on the show, we talked about a town hall that Kamala Harris did, a potential 2020 presidential contender and also a senator from California. And one individual decided to ask her whether or not she would be willing to reject corporate PAC money. And at the time, she said no, she wouldn't be willing to reject corporate PAC money. However, in a recent interview with The Breakfast Club, she's indicating that she recently had a change of heart. And I saw you talking about uh, corporate donations. Yeah. And, and you said you, you would, you depended, depends whether you would take them or not. You know, I was asked, I did a town hall of, a couple weeks ago in California, and I was asked that question. And um, I, I wasn't expecting the question, and I, and I thought about it afterwards. And I'm going to tell you, Charlemagne, I actually, um, I think that 
money has had such an outside influence on politics mm. and especially with the Supreme Court it, determining Citizens United, which basically means that big corporations can spend unlimited amounts of money influencing a campaign, right? We're all supposed to have an equal vote, but money has now really tipped the balance between an individual having equal power in an election to a corporation. So I've actually made a decision since I had that conversation that I'm not going to accept corporate pack checks. Wow. Um, I just, I'm not. So how are you going to raise money for campaigns and stuff? Well, you know, I've, I've raised so far this year $3 million for my colleagues mm-hmm. for the 2018 election cycle. And most of that money has been like an $18, $20 increments. People are turning out. So this is definitely good news. I have no problem giving credit where it's due. This is the right step. But let's be let's be realistic here. Koala Harris is only doing this because she knows there's no chance in hell she's making it through a Democratic Party primary if she is going to take corporate PAC money. That's the reality of the situation. So that's why she's doing this. Now, that's still a good thing. That shows that progressives, we actually have quite a bit of power and influence because Democrats know that if they want to win, if they want to become president, they have to win us over. And they're trying to do that now. Some of them are. Certainly not the ones who are not running for president, but the ones who are running for president. They know that progressives aren't willing to just lie down and accept whatever neoliberal shill the Democratic Party establishment tries to shove down our throats. We're not. And the fact now that corporate Democrats like Kirsten Gillibrand, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, they're all saying that they're going to do what Bernie Sanders has been doing throughout his whole career and reject corporate back money, I think that is huge. So what they're trying to do is make sure that what happened to Hillary Clinton in 2016 doesn't happen to them in 2020. They know that there is a huge left-wing wave that's coming to make sure that the Democratic Party moves back to the left. And we're not going to let anyone through the Democratic Party primary if they're corrupt, if they're brazenly corrupt. I still have a lot of issues with Kamala Harris, Kirsten Gillibrand, and Cory Booker, and you should too. We have to remain skeptical because as a friend of the show, David Dole, host of The Rational National, pointed out on Twitter, Kamala Harris had a meeting with Hillary Clinton's biggest financial backers in the Hamptons in July of 2017. That recently. So to claim that she cares about the corrupting influence money has on politics and to only now come to this realization that we have to do something about it conveniently uh, a year before she announces her candidacy for the presidency, it seems a little bit disingenuous. But with that being said, I don't want to shit on corporate Democrats when they do the right thing. I want them to know that we are willing to take yes for an answer. And if they're going to actually fight for things like Medicare for all, then I'm going to applaud them for it. I'm not going to say, oh, well, they only did it because they want to win. Well, I don't give a fuck how we get to the policies that uh, we need and want. I don't care how we get there. All I care about is getting there. Now, with that being said, I find it a little bit strange that we don't see people who are corporate Democrats who co-sponsored Bernie Sanders' Medicare for all bill speaking out about Medicare for all. So, Brian Schatz, for example, he co-sponsored this bill, but then he went on to talk about how he's pretty much against Medicare for All. So, co-sponsoring Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All bill was nothing more than political theater. So, look, we, we have to stay vigilant. We have to understand that these are calculating corporate Democrats who want to win. They're politically ambitious. So, they're going to do everything they need to, to make sure that they win. This is part of that. But if they're, if they're making improvements, if they're moving in the right direction, that's still a good thing. I still applaud them for it. And I think we also need to pat ourselves on the back because we did this. Anyone who bemoaned progressive purity tests, um, now they see why that's important. It's because by actually having standards, that moves Democrats and politicians, generally speaking, in the right direction. They're supposed to represent us, so why shouldn't we demand that they represent us adequately? So look, this is this is good news. Um, kudos to Kamala Harris for actually doing the right thing here. Um, this should be something that everyone in the Democratic Party does, but they're not going to do it unless they're running for president. With the exception of Joe Biden, because he's definitely running, but he hasn't done this. But I think that he believes he could still get through a primary, coasting on name recognition 
and nostalgia through the Obama years alone. But it's not going to work for you, Joe. We're going to fight you. You will be our Hillary Clinton this time. So we will fight you and we'll fight any corporate Democrat that's not unapologetically progressive. Bernie Sanders is undoubtedly boosting his resume ahead of his 2020 presidential campaign. And one other bullet point you could add to his resume of policies that he is talking about is a federal jobs program, something that I've talked about on the program that we desperately need in this country. So he's proposing a jobs guarantee for every single American in the country and not just any job. Jobs with a living wage, actually well-paying jobs. So he hasn't actually released the plan yet, but preliminary details have been leaked to the press and it seems great. So according to John Bowden of The Hill, Senator Bernie Sanders is set to announce a federal jobs proposal that would guarantee a job with at least a $15 per hour wage and health benefits to every adult American who wants or needs one, the Washington Post reports. The senator is still in the early stages of crafting the plan, according to the Post, which would provide a job or required training for any American. Sanders' office has yet to release the details of the plan's funding, but previous large-scale projects proposed by the Vermont Progressive have involved ending tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans and corporations. The proposal would have trouble gaining enough Democratic support to get real traction, and conservatives have long said a jobs promise is unsustainable and unaffordable, citing costs, the effects on the private sector, and the possibility of inflation. It completely undercuts a lot of industries and companies, Brian Reitel of the conservative-leaning Manhattan Institute told The Post. There will be pressure to introduce a higher wage or certain benefits that the private sector doesn't offer. So this is a phenomenal idea, but think about the main criticism that conservatives are lobbying against this. It's going to force the private sector to compete with Bernie Sanders' federal jobs program, which will basically force them to pay their employees higher wages and offer them benefits. That's a good thing. Why aren't they already offering them higher wages and benefits? Corporations are making record profits. Republicans just voted to give them trillions of dollars in tax cuts. And this Republican douchebag is trying to tell us that them giving workers a higher wage, or basically us tying their hands and forcing them to pay their workers a living wage and give them health benefits is a bad thing? It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Whoever's against this clearly doesn't care about the American people and cares more about corporate profits than anything else. Now, they mentioned in the article that it would have trouble gaining traction among even the Democratic Party, which is absurd to me because if you really want to show voters that you care about them, there's really no better way to do that than coming up with a federal jobs guarantee program that will benefit every single American. I think that if you're against this, you just reveal yourself as a corporate sellout. I don't like to really speak in absolutist terms like that, but how could you be against this? This is something that will undoubtedly benefit the American people, people who need jobs. It would benefit millennials who are getting out of school with thousands upon thousands of dollars in student loan debt. It would benefit homeless people. They'd be able to get a job and pull themselves out of homelessness. And it would help people pull themselves out of poverty. And automatically, with the article announcing this, that Bernie Sanders will be releasing legislation to guarantee a job to every American, you already have the critics speaking out against it because they care more about corporate profits than anything else. We're on to you. Americans know that we live in an oligarchy where the profits of large multinational corporations are valued more than the lives of ordinary citizens. What they're doing here is they're undermining capitalism. It's why we all hate capitalism. It's because all capitalism does is exploit the working class at the behest of oligarchs in this country. And they're saying that they want to continue that exploitation and us taking gradual steps to level the playing field is bad because it's going to force these corporations to compete with the federal government. Boo-hoo. That's all I got to say. Boo-hoo. I don't care. Um, if you can't pay your workers a living wage, which they can, but if you can't, and if you can't offer them health benefits, then you shouldn't be in business anyway. Go out of business. Bye. But I mean, we're talking about companies that 
they they have CEOs. I mean, for example, the Walmart CEO that makes what is it a thousand times more, more than a thousand times than their low workers. That is absurd. What kind of a country are we living in where we allow grotesque levels of wealth like that to exist and then we reward them by giving them more tax breaks on top of their greed already? It's just, it's absurd. So this is absolutely something that I think is going to be beneficial and will be a huge motivator for people to come out and support Bernie Sanders in 2020. It's great. So kudos to him for introducing this. I look forward to seeing the final version of this bill, but um, it's certainly a huge step in the right direction that would help American workers. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far in the show. Um, thank you so much for watching. Um, I want to thank all of our Patreon and PayPal contributors as usual because you guys, I always tell you this, you help us not just survive but thrive as well. Uh, I apologize for not having a guest on this week. Next week, I will have Jordan Sheridan on the podcast to talk about his brand new media outlet, Status Coup. So you'll definitely want to tune in uh, to that. It's going to be great. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you all next week. Thank you so much again for tuning in um this is the humanist report take care did it work nope we're still recording